Josh Plutkin, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you are in Brazil. You're in what city? I am in Belo Horizonte. You can see that in the back right there. I've got the, the map of, of Belo Horizonte. But you're actually an American, right? Yeah, so I'm from California. I've been in Brazil for about two years now. Um, we actually met up in, in Sao Paulo last year at the Mises, uh, Mises Conference, Mises Brazil right. Conference last year. Um, unfortunately, they're not going to have one this year, so you know, can't come back for that. Are they really not going to have one? Yeah, I, I guess they're, um, they're busy with, with other things, and it's they want to. It's not not a cheap event. It's not as easy to do these kind kind of events in Brazil as it is in the U.S. So next year, for sure, they'll be having it though. Okay. Well, yes, and so the thing that impressed me <clears throat> uh, when I met you was that. Uh, you had just decided to pick up. You saw a lack of opportunity in the U.S. and decided to pick up and and move to Brazil, learn a new language, and start a new life. Yeah, you know, there was a, a path that really started about five years ago when I came in contact with uh, the Mises Institute and, and all the all the, the teachings of uh, the Austrian economics and, and all this stuff. It's led me to where I am today. Um, if if I hadn't had a, such a strong conviction that the, the U.S. is, is not uh, going to be the land of opportunity in the future, then it wouldn't have been such an easy thing for me to come here. But for me, I, I, I saw, I felt no other option than to actually just leave the U.S. and go somewhere else. Yeah, and you know, since you left, uh, there's been no improvement at all in the job prospects for young people. The latest unemployment numbers uh, leave com young people completely untouched. It's 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 just so sad because if more people would just leave the country and go anywhere, their job prospects would immediately improve significantly. Uh, the like just talking about Brazil, there's a huge shortage of skilled labor, and the government is, is actively trying to bring in uh, like engineers and doctors now because they don't, they're not they don't have enough qualified people uh, amongst their their own population to do that. So they're actively bringing in, in foreigners to do those kind of jobs. And if you just look to anywhere in, in the world, there you, you take something that you that might not be worth a lot in the U.S., which is your, your college education. And it's, it's worth a lot more outside of the U.S. But how do you get your feet on the ground? I mean, you arrive, do you, do you wait um, to scope out the place until after you've settled in, or do you try to get something fixed up before you leave? Yeah, so the, the way I kind of got here, I, I started out in, in Mexico. I didn't really know much about what I wanted to do. I just know I wanted to get out of the U.S., so I went and worked on a farm in, in Mexico. Uh, a lot of Mexicans go go to the U.S. to work on a farm, but I thought it'd be, be fun if, if I went and worked on a farm in Mexico. Uh, I volunteered on through a program called WOOF, W-W-O-O-F, the Worldwide Organization of Organic Farmers. So that's that's like, I, I was always trying to find a way to get a connection into to a local scene so that I wouldn't have to do things by myself because the, the more that you do it by yourself, the, the more you're going to struggle. So, uh, but farming didn't work out for me. And I, I realized though that I wanted to continue this lifestyle of living abroad. So I only got an English teaching certification uh, and then went to Colombia where I was completely on my own and uh, just re was really struggling a lot there, running through my savings and didn't have a, uh, a lot of ease in, in getting into the English teaching scene there. And so when my brother invited me to go to Brazil with him, I, uh, I said, sure. I hopped on a bunch of buses, went down south through Peru and, and Ecuador, Ecuador and Peru. Then like spent 10 days on boats going across the Amazon jungle, uh, Amazon River. Met up with him in, in the middle of, of the Amazon rainforest in, in Manaus. And... Then um, you know we went, we went to a city where he does business in the south, uh, kind of near Rio, uh, called Vitoria, and I, he had a lot of friends there that he introduced me to, and, and that was a big help for me uh, in the beginning was, was knowing people. So kind of roundabout answer to your question is you, you really want to know someone 
before you, you go to a place because that will just make your life so much easier. Well, and then now with today's networking tools, I mean, isn't it possible to kind of post, you know, on your your LinkedIn account or your Facebook account or Twitter out, oh, okay, I'm, a, I'm in Ecuador, uh, who who would like to meet up? Yeah, there, there, there is no excuse for you going to uh, just about anywhere in the world and being alone when you get there. I, I made my things harder for myself than they should have been. You can, there's so many networking tools like you mentioned, LinkedIn, Couchsurfing, if you look for a place to stay. Um, there's a, a Couchsurfing for entrepreneurs, I forget the, 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 the name of it. Um, but you know, there's just all sorts of ways that you can get in contact with people. There's Facebook groups, um, try, like if you're a libertarian and you want to meet, stay with, meet up with other libertarians, try to find a, a libertarian Facebook group for that country and, and say, hey guys, um, you know, showing up and it can kind of crash somewhere and um, I'm sure many Brazilians would be more than than welcome to let you stay, let an American libertarian or Canadian libertarian stay with them. Interesting. Now you mentioned something about savings. So you kind of have to have your financial life in order, right? You got to kind of get out of debt, uh, get a little surplus, lighten up the, the load a little bit. If you're going somewhere without a plan, then you got to have a reserve. But if you have a plan, before you go, I just went without a plan. I just I had to, knew I had to leave, so I just figured things out as I went. But um, that's not the, the best way to do it. And if so, if you are committed to, to one place, let's say you're coming to Brazil and you want to make things work here, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of money. It like just um, if you come here and, and you teach English, you can make a, quite a lot of money. More than you can make back home, probably. Uh, the starting pay for, for many English schools is thirty reais an hour, so that's about fifteen dollars an hour. And the if you teach in private students, it's you know somewhere around forty-five to sixty reais an hour, so like you know twenty-five, thirty dollars an hour. And then in Sao Paulo, people are making crazy salaries teaching English. You know, anywhere around uh, you know, between fifty and, and Hundred dollars an hour teaching English, mm. and the, the the higher end teaching gigs, you really got to have some kind of specialization to do that. But um, just leveraging your, your you already have your ability to speak English. Just about anybody can come to to, to Brazil and, and you know find work and add value. And what about the language to teach to teach English? You have to know something about the language of the place you're going to, right? Not necessarily. If you're thinking about English teaching in the way that you were taught English in high school, then you know if you're going to do that kind of job, then you might have to uh, speak Portuguese. But when I say English teaching, I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one private instruction. With most cases, these people already speak some English, and as a native speaker of English, you're real. Uh, Advantage. The niche that you should go after is is intermediate and advanced level students who are trying to learn just, just want conversation practice. They already can speak. They they want to learn slang. They want better pronunciation. They want to learn idioms and all, all that kind of thing. You don't need to speak Portuguese to be able to teach them English and to help them with their English. It helps to get inside their head and understand the mistakes they make. But you can with time you'll be able to pick that up. What does it matter for you that Brazil is essentially a socialist country? How does that affect you? Well, if, if you let it affect you, it, 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 uh, it can really get you down because Brazil is not anywhere close to being a libertarian country. It is, the, the government here is, is quite big. It's probably one of the biggest uh, in the world. But as, as a tourist or just someone passing through or... Um, someone who, who's kind of parked temporarily here, um, someone who isn't um, like a full-blown citizen of, of Brazil, your your exposure to to the, side, to the government is, is limited. You don't have to, um, you know, you're not paying income tax. But uh, I just in my day-to-day -day life, though, I feel a lot freer than when I was living in the U.S. I don't, when I see cops, I don't like think to myself, oh, wait, uh, am I breaking?
question any one of these 10,000 laws that they created last year. <laughs> the, 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 the cops here, the police here, like in, in general, they, they're here to protect people and not to, to go um, right. after people who are, are drinking raw milk or you know, who, who are drinking 20-ounce sodas in New York. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, if you're not uh, planning to open up an oil refinery, you're not going to be bumping into the, 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 the hardcore socialist bureaucrats at all, right? Yeah. I mean, the, you'll definitely feel the effects of, of the government in your day-to-day life. Most, for anybody who, who has read, um, you know, Hazlitt, in Economics in One Lesson, you're, you're trained to, to see the unseen, you'll see the hidden cost of, of the, the government everywhere you walk. You'll see roads that aren't as, as developed as they could be. You'll see buses that are inefficiently run. You'll see goods that cost twice as much as they should. You'll see just all these things that, that aren't there because of these government policies. Um, so, and just the general efficiency of the country is, is quite, it's bureaucratic. It's very bureaucratic, and that has to do with, with the you know, size of the government. I noticed when I was there that there seemed to be a strong, <clears throat> what's sometimes called informal sector, meaning that these are kind of uh, people selling fruits and uh, uh, meats and cheeses and things like that in these kind of open air markets and things I can't imagine that they're all you know compliant with some kind of central plan yeah there's a, a word that Brazilians like to use when they're talking about this kind of gray area it's uh, the jeito or the jeitinho brasileiro which is literally translated as the little Brazilian way mm. and it's it's a, a term used to talk about when um Brazilians will find a way to just do something kind of in the face of, of these, these regulations that often contradict each other, these laws that, that um, if you follow them to the letter, the whole country, it wouldn't be possible for the country to run because there's, there's so many laws that just trying to get, get um, prohibit almost anything. They, 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 they do, do contradict each other themselves in a lot of ways. So Brazilians have to find a way uh, around that, get creative with, with how they do that. I mean, that's more and more true in the U.S. too, what you described. Maybe it's not as extensive, although I'm not even sure about that, really. I think Americans are kind of <clears throat> better at hiding it, maybe, because there's a strong incentive to hide it in the U.S., which, whereas in Brazil, it's, it seems more open. Yeah, I think the the difference between Brazil and the U.S. in that regard is that the U.S. government has the tools to go after everybody if they wanted to, whereas Brazil's government isn't efficient enough to crack down on every agorist uh, gray market activity. Right. Yeah. And in, in, in that regard, I think Brazil is kind of an agorist paradise. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's this huge government, but in spite of that, there's all of this uh, gray market activity going on. Yeah, well, you recall that my first uh, articles that I wrote when I came back from Brazil was, you know, I was like, oh my God, you know, I've experienced freedom. And all these Brazilians were very angry at me, you know, like, uh -huh. how dare you say this, you know, that there's anything free about this country, this is tyranny. We wish we were more like the United States. And, and there was this argument that ensued, you know, who's, who's less free, you know. <laughs> Whose government is worse than, yeah. my government's worse than yours, right? Yeah. <laughs> It, it always seems it always seems worse in a in a way I think in in your own in your own country I mean maybe that's maybe that's a lesson I don't know but but I mean just objectively speaking what you mentioned about those police that's the thing that struck me the most when I was in Brazil I just had the sense that I could <clears throat> you know walk around and uh, do what I wanted and I wasn't being hounded or looked at I mean it's funny how Americans have kind of gotten used to looking over their shoulder all the time yeah it, it's it's I think one of the, the main cultural differences between Brazil and the U.S. is that when I go back to the U.S., I just get the sense that everybody is afraid of everyone and everything. You know, they're afraid of strangers talking to them. They're afraid of, of bees. They're afraid of, of, of terrorists. They're afraid of the police. They're afraid of their parents or their family. There's just so much fear in our culture. And in Brazil, you don't, you don't feel that. 
uh, people are are always happy to meet strangers. They're always happy to help people. You, um, even though Brazilians probably have a more legitimate reason to be afraid because of you know high crime statistics, they don't let it get to them. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I have to tell you, I experienced the same thing everywhere I've traveled internationally, actually. And although I knew that things had been declining in the United States, it really hits home when you, when you go abroad. You realize just even if you accept you know, the idea that you have individual rights and you have every right to be free, uh, uh, there's something about experiencing that, you know, just that brings it all home to you and you, you suddenly are aware, oh, uh, this is what freedom feels like and this is not freedom that, you know, that we once had, perhaps. Yeah, you, you kind of get a sense for, for what you've lost when you go abroad and you're able to, I mean, I, I was 10, 11 when 9-11 happened, um, it, yeah. but I kind of get a feel for what life must have been like for normal Americans before. 9/11. You know, you can go to the airport and you know have a knife in your pocket, and they, they don't, uh, you know, they don't even care too much, and uh, you know they don't make you take your shoes off. Um, you can just not have to deal with all, all of these oppressive regulations and, and just government trying to get their hands on everything you do. Yeah, well, actually, you know, I mean, the the the, the truth is that. Um, this all began to change about 1995, I think. It was about the time of the Oklahoma City bombing that the police went from being, thinking of themselves as community servants to starting to think of the community as the uh, potential enemy. You know, there was a, a paranoia that, that kind of began to grip the whole public sector. And, and that's, that grip has just grown uh, tighter and tighter over time. Yeah, the it's it's not a healthy world to be in when the people who are supposed to protect you are trying to protect themselves from you, um, and it's it's you know I I think I could go back to the U.S. and and maybe be happy there again um, now that I've gone abroad and experienced. You could come here and teach Portuguese. <laughs> yeah, I know. The, just by having gone abroad, and whereas when I left, I didn't really have many marketable skills. Now, a couple of years later, I have um, no shorter, shortage of opportunities that I could follow. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's really the, the lesson for anybody who's sitting at home and who doesn't know uh, what to do with their life. They, they think they don't have any options. Just leave the country, and right. your options multiply. Discover new things. And yet, uh, Americans are oddly reluctant to do that. I felt like for some time that's the most important thing that a, a person could do, you know, as a young person, is use use that opportunity uh, where you're still free to move about and you haven't accumulated a lot of personal property you're having to drag around. <clears throat> Get out of the country, see the world, discover new things. It opens up the imagination. Yeah, if, if you're 22 and broke and you're sitting at home and you go abroad for a couple years and, you know, you you fail at everything you do, and you return home, uh, 26 and broke, and living with your parents. What's you know you, you haven't really lost anything, but you've gained so much. Yeah, gain new insights and understanding. Well, how long do you expect that you'll be in in Brazil? Well, Brazil, I plan on being here for a while. I I branded myself as the Brazilian gringo, mm -hmm. and now what I, I do is I try to help people come to Brazil and make their lives easier. Uh, just taking all the experiences that I've learned and um, have written about them, and, and uh, trying to make uh, just make the path for people coming here a lot easier. Because really, the biggest challenge is is good information and um, networking with the right people. So those are the two things that I, I focus on uh, on my site. So I'm I'm gonna be here for a while. I I do want to go to other places, but right now Brazil is has a a lot to offer me, and I feel like I have a, a lot of value that I can uh, add to the country here. So I'll be here for at least a couple of years. So as long as you got a strong internet connection, you're there. <laughs> yeah, if as, as long as I have internet, you know, I can I can make it anywhere in the world, and 
Um, but even if I didn't have internet, you know, there'd be, uh, I'd still be here because there's just so much you can do online and offline and bridging that, that gap too. Like anybody with technology skills who can make websites, who does SEO, who does internet marketing, who does anything online, it, Brazil, it's like going back in time seven years. Uh, the market here isn't as, as developed and so they're, they're just playing catch up. Like really, the uh, big money is being made by taking startups that work in the U.S. and just copying that idea and making it work here. Extraordinary. <clears throat> well, how can people find your, your writings? Uh, do you have, uh, you run a blog or? or uh... Yeah, BrazilianGringo.com. Uh, there's a, a, loads of information there about teaching English and uh, a little bit about learning Portuguese and just other things that would be useful for someone who is, is thinking about making the jump to Brazil. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for your, your time and uh, best of luck to you and let's stay in touch. Definitely. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's okay, a pleasure to talk with you again, Jeffrey.